Okay, well, if you haven't met our amazing, famous George Leith, he is our Chief Customer Officer here at Vendasta. Um, you may know him from probably a dozen of our academy courses talking about sales, social selling on LinkedIn. He is also the founder executive producer of the Conquer Local podcast, which we are now in our fifth season. I was the producer. Uh, now I get to say that I'm the executive producer. Brett, who is normally here but couldn't make it today, is our fantastic new producer, and he works with George really closely. I think recording uh, another fresh set of episodes, so if you haven't checked out the podcast, please like, subscribe, leave us a review, uh, toss in the community if you have any episode ideas. We will crush them out. Anyways, George is here. He's going to talk about the trust matrix for everyone. Uh, listen closely, because this is a man who could probably sell you a wet sponge. Only if, you, only if you need one. <laughs> Take only it away. You need a wet sponge. Can you see my screen okay? Is that is that working now? This is some new tech that we've been uh, putting together. I can see you. We're yes, just seeing your face. Yeah. And now can you see a nice little animation there? Yeah, look at you. Look at that technology. Look at that. Look at All right, that. Well, welcome everybody. And I'm going to give you a bit of a, about a 20 minute session here, and then we'll have some Q and A afterwards. I'm looking forward to some debate. The uh, trust matrix is uh, a George Leith original. Um, I call that out because I've had a lot of originals over the years that I haven't trademarked. So I'm trademarking this shit uh, because, you know, when you, um, when you have an interaction with a customer, I believe that there is this concept of a trust matrix that's sitting there and, and I want all of us to start thinking about this component. So let me, let me get your buy-in over the next 20 minutes as to what I'm talking about. And this will help you in, in any communication that you have. Um, and the reason for this, why do we come up with this stuff? Is because what I was noticing in, with our internal teams that I've been doing a lot of work with in the last uh, year or so on building out some training components for the, the Vendasta teams is we've continued to grow at an astronomical rate. We have to come up with scalable ways to train our team. So working with uh, Maxim, who leads our uh, training team, we've been building out some components that then our sales managers and sales directors would be able to utilize with their sales reps, whether it be on the business development rep side, which is the acquisition motion that we have at Vendasta, or the partner development side, or even when it comes to product managers interacting with you or product marketers, and some of you have been uh, nice enough. If I, if I could encourage everybody just to go on mute, please, that'd be great. Um, and those product managers, when they're having a communication with you, I've listened to a few of the calls and I'm like, wow, uh, I don't really think that you built a lot of trust there with the customer. I think you might have just confused the hell out of them. Um, and I think that all of us could fall into that trap because we're, you know, we're offering a lot of different solutions when we go to our clients. So this is a problem that I've um, witnessed over the years. I think that it, it is actually growing as a problem. Um, the more solutions that we have to offer or the more features that we have in those solutions, there is more of a chance. And, and I think that some of us are just off on the wrong foot with this thing. We believe that, well, I'm going to show more bells and whistles and I'm going to gain more trust from the customer or the prospect. But actually what I'm finding is that we're confusing the hell out of them by offering those, um, those features and benefits ad nauseum. We just, you know, what you are is you're not actually a sales professional and you're not consulting the business person. You are what I call a technical teller. You get on the phone, you press the buttons, you show the great little feature, you tell them why that feature has a benefit. But as you go through the laundry list of features, the prospect, you know, they might even have what I like to call an exorcist moment where the eyes roll back in their head because you've just confused the hell out of them. And what you're doing is you're at, you think you're building trust, but actually what we're doing is we're installing fear. So when we go through the trust matrix, we got two components. We have fear on one side and we have trust on the other. And fear of that prospect or that customer, we could be installing fear ourselves as the sales professional or as the organization, but also there are outside factors that are building fear. In the eyes of that pro in the mind of that prospect or that customer. So an example is: imagine you uh, you give the the online business toolkit to a customer, you give them the uh, local business uh, the uh, all of those express products, 
and the person that's using it, so the business owner gets it, they give it to Sally, and uh, Sally is tasked with using these great tools that you gave to the business owner, and Sally doesn't understand how they all work. She doesn't understand the, what buttons to push. She's never really been onboarded properly. And guess what she does? She goes to the business owner and she says, yeah, you know that business toolkit thing that you told me I need to use? It sucks. Uh, it doesn't work. Too hard. Um, too many buttons. I don't even know what half this stuff means. And that fear of the prospect or the customer is installed by one of their staff members that is using the tool that just hasn't been trained properly. Like they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they don't know. Or here's another example of where fear could be installed in your relationship that you have with that prospect or customer. Competitor. Competitor comes in and they say, oh, you, oh, uh, you got this tool from this other agency in town. Let me see it. And they show it because it's pretty cool. And they go, oh, that, that thing won't work. That's horrible. This thing's better. My thing's better. That's what I would do. If I was calling on the customer and I found out that they were talking to a competitor, I would just pick that thing apart. Like, I don't mean slam them because that doesn't work out for you. But I mean, in a, in a very professional way, say, well, you told me that the solution that you were looking to solve was this. And that looks like it's solving this problem over here. Or that looks like it solves a lot of problems. Maybe you're paying way more money than you should. I'm just going to focus in on this problem. So you can see where fear is being installed by maybe the user using the product, or it could also be installed by competitors talking to that customer or that prospect, or they could have internal bias that has been there over time. It's like, yeah, I was, I was calling on a, a customer in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, and uh, this customer was a plumber and electrician, so we were doing a four-legged call. My two legs two legs of the sales rep. I love those, by the way, very best part of my job. And I get to sit across from a business owner and help them solve their problems. And I remember uh, sitting down with this customer and they, they didn't even want to give us time. The sales rep set the expectation. They said, George said they give us 15 minutes. We left 90 minutes later. We earned more time from that prospect. We, we were just earning trust as we went through. And what I found out was that that prospect had an enormous amount of fear when it came to digital marketing solutions. And guess why? They had dealt with another agency in the market that had screwed them over and they had given them fake news and they'd lied to them. So they had a bad experience with a local provider. And then the current provider that they were working with had a $180,000 budget with that customer. And as we earned five minutes more of their time, you know, we're earning trust as we go through the call, the client opened up even more about their fear. The number one, they had a fear that if they don't spend 180 grand, they're going to have no hope of making sure that they have enough business in the very important winter months because we met them in October. So we're getting in their really good time of year. But um, it, it was really interesting to me to see all of the biases that they had based upon the relationship that they had with the agency that they fired. And then based upon the platform that they were using today, and you know the, the very, very basic thing that I did was is show me the reporting. Show me the reporting that that platform is giving you. And they gave me this beautiful, it was awful, by the way, it was some of the worst friggin' reporting I've ever seen in my life. I'm not going to mention the platform, but uh, if any of you run up against it, you will win because it's just horrible. They're giving way too much information to the plumber. And when I talked to this guy, Rob, and I said, Rob, what is most important to you? He said, I just want more leads. <laughs> just get me more people that I can talk to, and then I'll do the rest. Because I do a really good job of servicing clients. I do a really good job of being able to get them across the line and figure out if we can solve their problem. He, he runs a good shop, but he just needs more people that he can talk to either on the phone or people who fill out his form, fill on his website. The guy's sending 20,000 emails a month. He understands that he needs to do email marketing. He understands that he needs, needs to do search engine optimization. He understood that he needed to do social. But when it came to how he felt about the relationship where he was spending 180 grand, an enormous amount of fear came out of that meeting. Needless to say, we won the business because we were able to install trust. So I feel that the trust matrix is a game changer if we start to think about our interactions with customers this way. And it's super simple. Some of the very best plays in business are the simplest. On one side, you've got fear. 
And there are a bunch of people that are depositing fear into the relationship. So here's an example. Oh, what, what am I going to look at for metrics? How am I going to know the bloody thing is working? How am I going to know, George, that you aren't lying to me like that other agency that I fired? Will we actually use it? This is what I find is one of the biggest risks that we have by all of the things that we can offer to the customer. Like we can solve a lot of their problems, but what we should do is we should solve the biggest problems first and then earn the upsell and solve more problems as we go. You eat an elephant one bite at a time. I've never actually ate an elephant, but it sounds like a really good way to run the play. But what we do, because we've got all of this stuff that we can do, and I would never trade that, by the way. I've been doing this at Vendasta for 10 years. I've been working for, with customers for 35 years. And in the early days of my sales career, when I was just selling radio, I wish that I could sell print because my customers were spending a lot of money on print. That's why I started a newspaper company. I'm like, God, all I wanted to do was be able to sell some friggin' print. But then when I was selling print, I was like, ah, shit, I wish that I'd be able to sell some radio too. So I, I, I had a great relationship with the customer, but I wanted to be able to solve more of their problems. Now enter into the scene that we're in today, 2022, we can solve a lot of the customer's problems. But if we make it look too hard, we're going to have a hard time building that trust in the early days. We need quick wins. We need to walk in and say, here I am. I'm the person that can solve your problem, the trusted local expert. I've ran some analysis. I have found the problems that you have. By the way, we're pretty good at this. Let me give you some testimonials and case studies of other people that I've solved problems for. I'm going to be here months from now. That's also the thing that I hear a lot of times. Yeah, I like dealing with these guys. Well, I kind of like dealing with them in the early days. Then they disappeared. And now all it is a toll-free number that I can call. So these are some of the things when I talk to customers that they tell me, they go, I, what I'm concerned about is, am I getting ROI from what I'm, what I'm buying from you? Then the other thing I'm concerned about is if I give it to Sally or Johnny or whoever it is, by the way, the, the, the I got a guy or I got a gal, I love that, right? Do you guys ever have that? You run into that, you call on a customer, they go, oh no, I got somebody looking after my digital. What they're actually doing is posting on Instagram. That is not a digital marketing consultancy. That is not it. That is not coming up with an entire digital solution for that customer. That's posting on friggin' Instagram. That's one tactic. So we got to watch out for that fake news that's coming from our prospects as well. Last thing they want to do is talk to a salesperson, by the way. So they're saying, no, I got somebody that looks after digital. And then after you identify a little deeper, you find out, no, they have somebody that posts on friggin' Instagram. That's all they have. Or they have somebody that updates their website. Or they have somebody that writes a blog post for them. They don't have an entire solution set to solve the problem from lead to bleed. But if we offer them the entire solution set, the first thing they will go is, whoa, that looks hard. I've tried this before, didn't work out, bought a whole bunch of crap that I never used. And then the other question that they ask is who the hell is George? Who the hell is this company? Like try working for a company named Vendasta. Most people can't even pronounce the bloody thing. And by the way, they can't pronounce Vendasta. They can't, definitely can't pronounce Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And that movie Grown Ups didn't help us because they made up a friggin' name, Saskatoon. So that doesn't work out for us. So giving them proof points for, and a lot of you on this call, I actually know a lot of you, and I'm, it's, I'm glad that we're able to have this time. They're wondering who the hell are you, especially if it's a cold lead, and why should I trust you? That's their question. And will you be here in six months? Because there's a lot of fly-by-night organizations walking in saying, I'm gonna solve all your problems. They watch a podcast or listen to a podcast. They watch a webinar. They walk in, they run the sales script. But the customer's sitting there going, you've given me absolutely no reason to believe you. You give me absolutely no reason to trust you. So I really believe that the trust matrix is in this. So if we've got a, there's a bunch of fear there right at the gate, by the way. You don't even have to measure this. I'm seeing some nodding on the call. There is a ton of fear on every prospect that you call on. And that has been there by their bias, their past relationships, people who've lied to them in the past, the fact that they bought software and they didn't find ROI, competitors that are making calls on them. So we have to, right out of the gate, start earning trust. 
The reason I tell you the story about the plumber electrician company from Winnipeg, Manitoba, is they were not prepared to meet with me. I got the 15 minutes because the rep from the, the channel partner had a really good relationship. He's billing $100,000 from that customer a year on legacy products. So we got 15 minutes and then we earned more time from the prospect five minutes at a time. And every five minutes, I could see that the light started to come on with Rob, the prospect. By the way, he got madder and madder and madder as we went through the meeting. At the end of 90 minutes, he said, why didn't I meet you three years ago? Because I could have saved myself 600 grand. Like he's running the math in his head and I'm sitting there going, he's been spending about 180 grand a year on Scott, on search. He's been running SEO and he doesn't know if the friggin' stuff works. I even said to him, I said, can you tell me the name of your customer service manager at the platform you're using? He said, no, it changes all the time. That's another, and then he got madder about that. Have you ever heard the old sales line? Find, find the uh, pain stick a knife in it and twist it. The pain was the prospect has been screwed over by everybody else that has sat in that exact same chair that I was sitting in. They have an enormous amount of fear, even with the 180 grand they're investing today. And all we have to do is build trust with that prospect by addressing their fears. Eventually we'll build up enough rapport. We can just ask them what their fears are. But in the early days of the relationship, we should be thinking about earning trust figure out what problems they have, figure out what numbers matter to the most, understand what they know and what they don't know. Here's one, did they even log into that toolkit that you gave them? Are they using the email notifications that they're getting? What have they done to interact with the solutions that you're giving to them? So what we need to do is make sure that this trust component is always outweighing the fear. By the way, fear never goes away. If you think that, oh, I've got an enormous amount of trust with that customer and they're not going anywhere. Any of you that have been doing this for a while, how does it feel to get punched in the face when that customer phones you and says, I'm canceling and I'm moving over to your biggest competitor? And you're like, what the hell happened? And they go, oh, it's not you, it's me. I needed different stuff. By the way, if your early dating years have ever taught you anything, when you were told it's not you, it's, it's me, it was always you. It was always you. They're lying to you. So we should always be looking. You got to get be a little bit curious all the time. I'd rather know that a train's coming to hit me. So I like asking for feedback from customers all the time. How's it going? How are we doing? I'll just randomly phone customers. Some of you have actually got my random phone calls. That's part of my freaking job as chief customer officer. Phone some customers randomly and say, hey, you're dealing with Rashida. How's it working out for you? I can see Rashida on my screen. Usually, 99.9% .9 of the time, everybody says, oh, we love Rashida. She's awesome. But we should be poking our nose in there. By the way, your customers love it. When you just randomly phone them, it's Friday, right? Some of you, I heard an English accent. So some of you are headed to the pub to have a pint here in about three minutes, right? <laughs> so I love about the English. They like beer more than Canadians. But what if when we're on our way to the pub later this afternoon, we picked up the phone and phoned a couple of our customers right now and said, hey, you know, it's the end of the week. I had a pretty good week this week. I wanted to phone and see how your week was. How's everything working out? But we don't like doing that because we're worried that they're going to say, oh, it's going to shit. Bunch of the stuff you gave me didn't work. I didn't get the leads that you said you didn't. We, that happens to us all. But I think that we should be always curious because we never know who's planted some fear in the mind of our prospect that last week. We want to make sure that in the trust matrix, we got this stuff going on, right? Not the fear piece, that we've got the trust piece that's always larger. And here's what I want you to take away from this. You need to always be making deposits on the trust side of the matrix, always. And the good news is we got all sorts of robots that can help us do that. Automations. Use robotic uh, process automation to replace the things that you need to remember. Now, for the young people that are on the call, eventually down the road, you will drink out of too many aluminum cans and your brain will start to go to shit. And that's happening to me right now. I'm forgetting things. By the way, young people, you forget things too. So it's all of us, we forget things. So what we need to do is figure out a cadence. We need to figure out a sequence of emails 
or maybe text messages or something that we can send on a regular cadence to our existing customers, not just the prospects that we're talking to. I find that organizations are so focused on getting a new deal, they forget about the deals they already have. And those deals are the ones that your prospects want to get, or I'm sorry, that your competitors want to get. They are laser focused on that stuff. Do any of you have a competitor that keeps you awake at night? Just raise your hands. Do you have competitors in your local market that are stealing your lunch? No, Kathy, come on. You're just so good that nobody's trying to steal your customers. I love that about you. But I'm telling you right now, there are people out there trying to steal your customers. I want you to think about that. It's, it's not negative. It's called measuring your risk. Now, what deposits on the trust side of the matrix did you make this week to make sure that those competitors aren't able to tell their story more than you tell your story? That's where we need some automations to do that. We need to get the next deal, by the way, because you can't outsell churn. So you always need to be depositing new business into your book of business. What is the, what is the attrition rate, just natural attrition rate of business? It's 14% right now. You're going to lose 14% of your business this year, and you can do the very best job that you want to do, but you're going to lose 14%. You know why? People leave town, they change jobs, and unfortunately, people die. So that's where attrition comes from. You're like, I work so hard to get that customer, and then they phone you, you phone them up this afternoon on your way to the bar, and they go, oh, I just got a new job. How's the great resignation happening? How's that working out for all of us? I worked on a deal for a year and a half. I had agreement to move to a pilot in March and I'm on my LinkedIn yesterday and my buyer got a new job. Those of you who know me, I said a bad word. I'm not gonna say what the word was, but all that work, a year and a half worth of work depositing in the trust matrix and now I lost my buyer and now I've got to start all over again. So this stuff is happening all the time. We need to be thinking about protecting our business, put a moat around our book of business, deposit into the trust matrix, continue to remember that fear is being deposited, whether we like it or not. It's deposited when they use the solution. It's deposited when they look at your reporting. It's deposited by competitors. So we better damn well be pushing some trust into that relationship at all times. So that is your community session learning for uh, this week. Appreciate everybody spending some time. And now we're going to open it up to some questions. My friends, my friends. Okay, so pure chaos if we want, but everyone raise your hand if you would like to ask a question, drop it in the chat. I will queue everybody up. Um, who wants to go first? I know everyone's like, mm, first question, don't want to unmute. I will pick on someone, maybe even if it's your first time, you know, get you out of the gate, <clears throat> Jeremy. Um, Hey, Jeremy, you have a question for Mr. George? No, you're good. Okay. I can, I can pick on someone else. Uh, no, I'll take that. I'll take that question. Yeah. I'll be the nice. first, Wonderful. first guy here. So thank you very much. That's a, that's a great discussion. And I'm also a relatively new Vendasta partner. Um, I come from, I hail from Stewart, Florida, where everything is done on a handshake. No one will buy from you unless they know you. We built our primary foundation by going to chambers of commerce, networking meetings, all that. So shifting over to the Mendoza model has been a bit challenging. And what we're working through right now is what does that new process look like? You know, how do, because the, the email campaigns are great. We're seeing great open rates, great click-through rates. What we're working on are the different phases. Phase one being we reach out through email. Phase two, do we now then send them, say, like a Loom video with a personalized walkthrough? You know, I'm, I'm curious, what, what are some of the successful things that really insert that trust um, that you build digitally that I'm, I'm used to building with a handshake? So now I'm trying to figure out how to do it online. So what are well, there that, any? Hey, Jared, that's a really good question. And I, and I, I want to share this. Like, I've, I've been selling for a long time and it's a constant battle to teach this old dog new tricks because, you know, I remember when I arrived at a tech company, I'm like, they're like, we're going to send some emails and you're going to get some leads. And I'm like, no, actually what they said, the CMO, Jeff Tomlin said, we're going to run some email campaigns. And you're going to make some sales. And I'm like, your email is not going to help me make a sale. Salespeople make sales face-to-face -face, on a handshake with trust. 
But here's what I believe with emails. I think that there is this feeling that I'm going to run a bunch of emails and money. Oh, you see, this was, I knew this is going to happen. And money will rain from the heavens. <laughs> <laughs> Had that all planned. That it is not sales automation. It's marketing automation. And what marketing is, is air cover for sales teams. Mm -hmm. What marketing is, is the ability to communicate with a bunch of customers. So I love the fact you're going to Chamber of Commerce, by the way. Like when I get fired, I've, all, I've said this for 10 years, I'm still here. But when I get fired, I'm just going to start an agency and do all the stuff that I'm doing today. I'll probably make a hell of a lot more money than I'm making right now. I'll have a lot more grief. But um, my point is, I'm going to go to Chamber of Commerce meeting, the very first thing I'm going to do. And I'm going to get the list. And I'm going to get a co-sponsor from the Chamber of Commerce. I'm going to send snapshot reports to everybody. And I'm going to do that with marketing automation. And the people that raise their hand, those are the ones I'm going to talk to. Because I'll tell you what would be inefficient is what I used to do when I was a media rep. And you would start on one side of Main Street and you would knock on every door with a flashing open sign. And you walk in and you drop off a package of stuff, kill a tree. I killed so many trees. Like, I, I feel bad. I should go plant a bunch of trees. And I would drop these packages off on people's desks. And then next week, I would come back. And I would go through and I say, hey, did you look at that package? And they go, what package? So the, the idea of the email campaigns across a list of accounts that you know that you, you want to poke at and see if they have an interest is just air cover. The things that we're used to doing where we meet with customers and we do videos and we bring them across, all of that stuff still has to happen. It's not run an email campaign and money rains from the heavens. It just doesn't work that way. <laughs> Thank you very much. Colleen, I have a question for George. Okay, Dim had his hand raised first and then it'll oh, okay. be your turn, Doug. Excellent. George, um, how, would you, um, how would you approach a, uh, uh, a small law firm that <clears throat> is looking to uh, do digital marketing uh, and their focus obviously is on, well, how many leads are you gonna get for me? Well, I love law firms. Um, well, that's not true. I hate law firms. And I love law firms. I hate them because when I get a bill, it's always expensive. But I love law firms because they have money to spend. And uh, if you were to talk to, is anybody here in the television business? I'm not sure if we have anybody in TV business. Television loves law firms. And in our market here in the middle of Canada, we get Detroit television. And I love Jeremy Figer, Figer Law. Because he runs a lot of ads on TV. And what I do know about television, it's still super expensive. So what I love about law firms is they have a budget that they want to deploy to get those leads. The question that I would have for the law firm is, what kind of leads are you looking for? Are you looking for business customers that are looking for corporate law? Are you chasing ambulances? Are you looking for, you know, personal injury law? Are you Clinical looking for... Clinical negligence. I'm sorry? Clinical negligence. Criminal negligence. Clinical. Uh, clinical. Clinical? Yeah. Clinical mm -hmm. negligence. So I don't, I think that that aligns with a corporate lawyer. And what we need to understand from that customer is what audience is looking for clinical negligence? How old would they be? Where do they live? What do they do for a living? Um, where, where might they be before they call a lawyer? Like I would ask the question, don't tell me who it is. Give me a scenario as to how you got your last customer or what do they call them in the law business? I don't know if they call them customers, clients, clients. <laughs> clients. So how did you get your, how did you get your last payday? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, understand that and then ask questions like, where would they be before they reached out to you? I think that on clinical negligence, they probably spent some time at a hospital. <laughs> Is that fair? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just understanding the journey that those clients go through when they make their decision criteria. You know who's really good at marketing to lawyers? a company called Find Law. It's owned by Thomson Reuters, one of the largest companies in uh, North America. And uh, if you go to their website, you can see the tactics that they're deploying to sell to law firms. And uh, I believe that legal is a very good category. If I look across the five and a half million businesses in the Vendasta platform, there's a bunch of law firms in there. And uh, they do deploy a lot of dollars 
in traditional marketing campaigns on television, particularly. Now, there are some rules. They're, they're very similar to the medical field where they have some rules from the associations that they belong to that they have to follow. So we got to be careful on that. And, you know, if you want to set yourself apart from everybody else that's call, calling on that clinical negligence law practice, I would ask those questions. What rules does the bar, there's usually a bar association, what do they, those rules have against uh, for you to advertise and promote yourself? And then they'll probably give you a, a document like that that you'll have to read through. But, you know, that just builds some trust, right? That, you know, you've worked with companies like that. You understand that there's going to be these concerns. Did that answer your question? Um, partly, partly, yes. Um, um, I, I still, I'm still not clear about the um, um, capping out the ROI part of the question. Well, what, what they're looking for is leads. Yeah. that they can talk to that can become clients. So it's the exact same thing as my plumber friend or electrical friend I was telling in that story. So what we need to understand is what journey does the client go through in their decision criteria to choose that law firm and get them, the other thing that I love doing, get the customer to talk about themselves. Get them to talk about their business. Get them to talk about the way they feed their kids. Now, here's one thing I know. Every business on the planet needs to be found. So they're going to need listing they're going to need their listings right. They're going to need GMB, yeah. Google. Well, I guess it's GBP, Google Business Profile now. They're going to need a positive reputation because if I'm going to hire a lawyer, I'm going to look at their reviews. 100%. I am not hiring a three out of five lawyer. That doesn't work out for me. So all of the key components of virtual presence are going to be at play here. There might just be some restrictions on what they can do on social and some restrictions on what they can do around advertising. So, you know, they have the same need as any business on the planet, hardware store, dentist, doctor, doesn't matter. Everybody's looking for new potential clients they can bring across the line. But where organizations fail is they don't talk to that law firm about understanding what is the journey that your customer or client goes through to make a decision to, to choose you. And then what is the lifetime value of that customer? Because the lifetime value of that client for the law firm will determine how much budget they're going to deploy. A lot, what I've found over the years, a lot of people decide their budget for marketing based on their ego. They don't base it on science. They don't base it on the lifetime value of the customer. But I see that starting to change more and more. It used to be I could just walk in there and George the customer and get a bunch of budget out of them. Like, hey, did you know your competitor just upped their budget? They're spending a lot of money this month. You might want to increase your budget to win in them. You know, those kinds of things. It's, it's a more scientific approach now where, to your point, if they're looking to measure their ROI, then we need to talk about, well, what would a potential new client be worth to you? And then here are some of the tactics we'd employ to get them into your funnel. Thanks. Thanks. Doug, you're up. Sorry about the delay on the unmute. George, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I didn't get my hand up fast enough when you were talking about the building and the trust aspect because getting an early win can make a huge difference. I had a you know, we've, I've been with Vendasta for a while and we didn't do a whole lot, but recently we've gotten re-energized and, you know, I've got a chiropractor, I've got a doctor, I've got a couple of restaurants. Uh, and really, our lighthouse has been the, the restaurant bar industry, but because it took such a beating through COVID, we had to pivot a little bit. But I've got two medical practices that are, you know, one's a chiropractor and one is more like a, almost like a medical spa. So they're not as heavy into you know some of the just they're, they're still all about patients and and serving the patient but it's a little different in their marketing niche and they've got a different approach and so uh i just went after uh, literally when checking are did you claim your google my business you know building some trust and and starting small and displaying an early win and all of a sudden they started throwing everything at me that's right. Really Earning the trust is the key. And what I like to do is give away a bunch of stuff for free. And that's hard. You're sitting with a customer. And when you're earning trust, you're like, hey, I notice you don't have your Google business profile claim. They're like, I don't even know what the hell that is. Well, hang on a second. Let me just show you what it is. And you guys should claim it. 
And what I want them to do is try and claim it and fail because I'm pretty sure I'll get a phone call if yeah. I built enough trust. And, and, and some and, people are like, oh, I want to keep that behind. I'll keep that in my briefcase. I don't want to bring that out. That's my thing. No, get so much stuff that you could do with that customer. In this Give particular them something case, to earn the trust first. In this particular case, he was spending over $2,000 a month with somebody for Facebook advertising alone. And I actually came to him through Facebook advertising, but it was starting to wane off because the algorithms had changed. And so I, I asked him, I said, well, are you getting three or four times that, what, whatever return you're getting on your Facebook, are you getting three or four times that from, from Google? And he said, no. And that pause would, just made me smile. I'm like, let me do a couple of things to help you right out of the gate. We'll make sure that this is optimized. They had it, he had claimed his Google My Business, but then we optimized it. And then we were going from there. And, and now he's throwing the, 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 the Facebook advertising and everything else our way because we showed him a, a minor victory. Yeah. No, it's it's so important. And, and you so know, I the guess other the last question is what would you recommend we do for minor victories? Would it be like a Google package with even the Google small business package? at 199 to get them an early win. I know the snapshot is incredibly powerful, but in some cases you're right, even that can overwhelm. Well, you know, so Google, um, the Google business profile as it's known today, formerly known as the artist, formerly known as Google My Business, that data that comes from there tells them what's going on with their virtual doorway and their actual doorway. How many people in the market are looking for the things that you sell? That's the first component that we're able to measure with that data. The second thing is, did people engage with your brand? So that is, they look at the photos, did they engage with your social media? Did they go, did they see the Google business, uh, sorry, yeah, Google business profile content that you're posting on there? So getting Google business profile installed in every customer should be the number one thing that we are laser focused on because everything works better. And there's a piece of content that Colleen will share out afterwards with the team, which is our retention study that we've been running for the last five years. And it showed that five years ago on 100,000 anonymized accounts across North America. That was where we first did the data. And it said that if you hook up Google My Business at that time, and you run an executive report, your retention rate goes up 55%. But then what's happened is Google has said, I'll give you better search rank. I'll make you appear in searches if you play our game, which means claim it, get some reviews, put some products in there, like really build that thing out, update the photos on a regular basis, put some posts on Google business profile. But you know, it's, I still see people not doing this. It is the thing that you need to lead with on every call. I just give it away. I would just give it away as a way to build trust and start the relationship because with that data, I can do a lot of other stuff. And it gives a quick, quick return that they can start to see, doesn't it? I mean, even just the data showing up, they go, oh, wait, that's more than I've ever gotten. You know, funny story, back in the day um, when Yext was building out their business model, and Yext is about 15, don't quote me on the number, but I think they're about 15 years old. They had a team of people in New York, about 300 people that were calling on local businesses. And they started to build that and they, they did really good revenue. I think they were doing about $30 million of revenue with that team. But what they did was they got the business on the phone and they ran the Yext listing sync right with the customer on the phone. They said, here's, your, here's your, all your broken listings right now. I'm going to press a button. <laughs> And they sync the data right on the phone. And then they said, here you are. Now all your data is correct. Maybe not on the navigation systems because that takes some time. But that's how they built that. They, they called it their SMB team. And they built up that chunk of revenue was with instant gratification with that customer. By the way, they weren't getting paid yet when they first ran the, the sync. And then if the customer said, yeah, it's too much money. I don't want to operate. Guess what they did? They just turned it off. Turned off right now, data reverts back to the crap that it had before, but you, you can see that the customer was looking for a quick win. And by the way, a lot of those customers didn't even know they had a problem. They didn't know they need to be listed on 70 listing. By the way, you don't need to be on 70 listing sources, but they didn't know they needed any of that stuff. So that instant win where you can show that you can move the needle 
instantly builds a lot of trust because everybody else in there is selling vaporware that's going to take nine. Have you ever had this conversation with a customer where you're not quite getting the results that they need? And they go, okay, it's been six months. What the hell's going on? Like they're getting impatient. This is great. Um, okay, we have 10 more minutes. If you aren't comfortable unmuting yourself, please feel free to drop it in the chat as well. We'll get to that. Um, Paula, last week you had some really great questions. If you want to unmute. Tim, Tim has his hand uh, raised, Colleen. Oh, Tim. Oh, Tim. Tim, you still there? Yeah. Do you Can have I another go? question? Yeah. I have a question for George. Hey, George, it's Tim Pringle calling. How you doing? Hey, my friend. How's Edmonton? Oh, it's cold and blistery. How are you? How's Saskatoon? We're not as cold as you. Cold. Sucks. <laughs> Plus, I Plus, my we don't have the Oilers, is, so we're good. Go Oilers, go. Four in a row, new coach. <laughs> I, my question is, why are you trying to get me up at 4.30 a.m. Mountain Standard Time for uh, Triumph Selling webinars? Why? Why uh, are you doing it? First off, it's not a webinar. It's just a live stream. And uh, I, I believe that live streaming is just about to go through the roof. Now, I know it's been around for a while, but remember that a lot of times, you know, the Ameris law comes in where technology is hyped up in the beginning and it takes a while for it to start to take off. But what I'm seeing is if you wanna manipulate the LinkedIn algorithm and get more communication with your audience, you've got to adopt their items. So that was the reason that I did, you think I have enough time to produce a newsletter every week. I got a lot of stuff going on. Um, but the, the other thing is I find that if I were to build 20 pieces of content in a month that were 15 minutes long, that could be live a long time online, I don't know if I could prioritize that time. But the minute that I told my audience that I was going to do this thing at 5.30 in the morning every day, now I got to do it. Or people are going to call me out and go, why are you giving up on that thing? Oh, that was such a, you know, so it's part of it is to hold me accountable to do it every day. But the other part of it is to del deliver a corpus of content utilizing those channels. And we're testing, Colleen's watching the metrics as well with a team. We're testing live streaming to see how powerful it is to build a brand. And uh, early indications, a couple of weeks into this, we're doing a mastermind on Saturdays and we're doing these, these daily standups. I call it a sales standup. Uh, it's incredible. And it's not just first level connections on LinkedIn. The, the thing that I've found in that the algorithm is prioritizing, I am getting so many more second level connections. Like my second level connections over the course of a week would be maybe 12% of all of the communications, but now they've skyrocketed to 60% in the last two weeks. That can't be a coincidence. And I've talked to other folks that are doing a lot of live streaming and they're telling me the same thing. So, you know, number one, uh, I have to deliver content. That's a really important part of my job. That's how I get paid. But number two, it's a test to see what's going on with live streaming uh, because everything that we're reading is that the adoption of live streaming really skyrocketed during COVID and it's a way to, to uh, put an exponential lift on your brand. Is, there's a rumor that you get in the office at three in the morning. Is that true? I've only been in the office at three in the morning five times, but I do get up at 3.30 in the morning. It's ridiculous. Don't, don't do what, it if what, you don't have to. What time do you get into the office? A little bit after six every day, unless I've got some European calls. What time do you go to bed then? Between 9.30 and 10. Wow, that's oh my goodness. You guys take your bromance offline, man. <laughs> Jesus, Paula, I Georgie. called on you. Paula, did you have a question to ask George? Um, no, I do not have any questions. I'm that's sorry. okay. I'm going to pick on someone else. Giovanni, Cheryl. Hey, guys. Hey. I really, uh, I've been listening in. I get some echo on my line here. Hearing my voice back, but. Oh, he. he I will. I will I, say. I, our, I oh, oh, Cheryl, go ahead. Our our um, podcast that we did about a year ago. I mm -hmm. constantly am getting contacts off of it. Really? Yes. That is you fantastic. One last week. Out of the blue. So fantastic. And you're so great, Cheryl. So thank you for coming on. Not a problem. Actually, Sorry, I someone was saying something. Oh, oh. Yeah, I wanted to ask you. a question about, I heard you say you had like international partners that you work with too. How do you go about um, 
like strategizing to build those relationships with people that are in different countries. Cause like right now I'm in the process of trying to do like a few endorsement deals and I have like contacts with like um, Adidas, Nike, um, Lululemon, just a few, but they're all based out of uh, Europe and like in the London area. So what's like the best way to be able to try to build those relationships with those partners that are, um, that are in different countries that you might not actually be able to, you know, carve out time to have like a one-on-one -on -one meeting or, you know, they're always busy because they have a lot of other projects and, and um, assignments that they work on for work. That's a great question. That's why you got to get up early in the morning. You got to stay up late at night um, because you've got to meet them on their time. And I, and I've found mm -hmm. this with one of our largest customers is the telecommunications company in South Africa. And uh, you know, South Africa is, is pretty much 12 hours difference, you know, between eight and 12 hours difference because there's different time zones in the country. So, you know, I'm the three 30 thing, by the way, is because of summer, because we're two hours off of the East coast. And then we lose another hour going into Europe. So as we started to build those international relationships, you've got to meet them at their time. The, the other thing is there's a lot of seven o'clock at night calls because that's morning in Australia. And we've got a very large footprint in Australia as well. So the, the international thing means you're not sleeping or you're sleeping at, at other times because you have to meet them at their times. If you try to shoehorn them into a North American time frame, I've found that that doesn't work out very well. Paula, you had unmuted. Oh, yeah, I was, just gonna say, I was just going to throw some love out to the live streaming thing. I've been doing it for the last three years now, and it's just ramped up in speed. And so um, I, I do this thing called 10 at 10. And really, all it was was really just marketing. And I realized sometimes my marketing wasn't working because their operations wasn't right. And I literally just shared all of the expertise that I knew on the operational side, but that gave me like a lot of love as well. So I get quite a bit of business from that live stream um, as well. So I now live stream from LinkedIn and I upload it to YouTube. So that's been really rewarding. So I just want yeah. to share. Let me, let me give you a, a tip uh, that I've learned from some friends of mine that do a lot of this. Um, I use a platform called Ecamm because I'm a Mac person. So you got to be on Apple to use yeah. Ecamm. And then you sign up for a free subscription to Restream. And don't spend money on it yet because what I hear under the hood from my spies at Ecamm is they're going to bring this into their platform. But what Restream allows me to do is to connect to Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn all with one feed. I could like do that. Facebook oh, too, but I'm feed? off the sauce. Well, um, give me I'm that name again. Abandoning Facebook. But the, the other thing is, They've got 20 different channels there. So when I do the live stream in the morning, it just automatically goes to all the channels. Give us that name again, because right now I'm using B Live TV. So it's called Restream. And the technology that I'm using for the, the video stuff is called Ecamm. And not even that much money, like 16 bucks a month. If you buy the annual plan, you get a deal. Restream, you can get it for free for a while. Uh, it, it's not even a it's not even a time box trial. It's actually just they've got a freemium model. Because B Live allows you to get to LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, but not simultaneously. You got to choose which one you live stream to, and you can have at least three people on split split screen. So that's been really cool. But it would be yeah. nice to live stream simultaneously to all of them. On um, on Ecam, I'm able. Are you guys able to see my screen still or no? no? You're not um, sharing. No. You can see me though, right? Yes. I'm going to bring a guest in right there, and you send them a link, and they're now in your green room. And when you want to bring them in beside you, right there, so it's very much like a, a TV esque experience that you can have. I can bring in five different guests if I want on this solution, not a paid political, I should get a, I should get an affiliate link for Ecamm, but uh, <laughs> you know, we, it's, it took me a while to learn it. And I believe that I might be an early tech adopter. Um, I think that that's probably fair. So it, it is a bit of an enterprise solution, but after you get the hang of it, it's very, very easy to use. Okay, everyone. Yeah, question so for you. I'm sorry, I missed at, your name. I guess my only concern really quickly is that getting the approval onto LinkedIn after I've just gotten it through BeLive, I'm, I'm, that's my only concern. No, it's a relationship with LinkedIn. 
Oh, they do. Okay. Yeah. And they you you used to have to apply for the creator tools, but I believe now they're open for everybody. In the early days, the newsletter and, and uh, live stream, you had to apply for it, but I think they opened it up. But I do have a question. Um, how many times you, have you done a live stream and there was nobody there? Um, quite a bit. However, I always get the kick in in the, um, the people who watch afterwards. Right. So, yeah, so I, I don't even worry about it if it doesn't happen. Thank you very much for sharing that. So I want to tell you a story and then I'm going to shut up. Um, years ago, when we started doing our first webinars at Vendasta, I would lose it when we had less than 50 people, which I think is this call right now. Mm -hmm. I'd be like, yep, come on, I'm George Leaf. I, I present to audiences. Like I go on stage. It's, you know, I, but what, what I found and somebody gave me this advice, they were like, you just got 49 hours of your life back because you had 50 people on that call. So when I have three people show up, I'm like, I just got two hours of my life back because I delivered a one hour presentation and it was viewed by three people. But you are 100% right. It is not the live stream, the metrics on the live stream. It's that piece of content that lives forever. If you go to my LinkedIn profile right now and you don't like waking up at 530 in the morning, you can watch this morning sales stand up and you can go back and watch the rest of them if you go far enough through my feed. That content lives forever. Okay, everyone, we are at time. So Doug and Daryl, please reach out to George on LinkedIn or email. Um, if he wants to share his email, just gives me the okay to type his email in here, which I'm just going to do anyways. Um, yes, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. This is going to be posted in the community. I'm going to share the link right here. Here we go. Um, also on our events page in the community, we've added a whole bunch of workshops. There's going to be 10 rolling out um, coming in the next two weeks or so. We also have our office hours that are happening on Tuesdays and Thursdays, Tuesdays after noon, 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern, Thursdays, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Eastern. So thank you everyone so much. Thank you, George, for coming in and sharing your wisdom. I feel like everyone on this call got so much out of it so don't worry everyone we'll have him back his office is like right behind me so i can just kick in the door at any time and and drag him back here so oh my God, thank you everyone thank you, thank you colleen thank you george thank you everyone. Hey, everyone have a wonderful weekend we'll see you next week